Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another special episode of the Speak Up for the Ocean Blue podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Lewin, and today I am partnering with the Blue Nature Alliance yet again to talk about marine conservation. And today's episode, we are going to focus on people, knowledge, and networks in ocean conservation and how important all three aspects are to the process of marine conservation. We have three wonderful ladies joining us for today's episode to provide us with more insight on people, knowledge, and networks within ocean conservation. We have Kate Brown from the Global Island Partnership out of New Zealand. We have Coral Pasisi, who is from the Tofia Nui uh, organization out of the island of Nui. And we also have Ginny Farmer, who's from the Blue Nature Alliance located in the United States. Uh, today, we're talking about what it means to be part of a network, what it means to have a, a multiple scale partnerships and how to interact with those partnerships. These ladies are going to be providing us some great insight in their experience over the last number of years, a number of decades that they've been working in the field of ocean conservation. So this is a great episode. I want you guys to enjoy this. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this interview with Kate, Coral, and Ginny. Uh, here we go, and I will talk to you after. Kate, Coral, and Ginny, welcome to the Speak Up for the Ocean Blue podcast. Are you ready to talk about people, knowledge, and networks in ocean conservation? Yes. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. I'm so excited to uh, to have to do this podcast. This is one of the only podcasts where I've ever done where we have people from all over the world. And so I'm super, super excited uh, to do these. And this is part of a uh, sort of like a special edition of the Speak Up for the Ocean Blue podcast where we're teaming up with Blue Nature Alliance to do a video podcast as well as an audio podcast to talk more about marine conservation and what it means, especially in local communities and meeting global sort of projections it's especially the protecting 30 uh 30 percent of the ocean by 2030 so it's a really big deal and so we're getting a lot of perspectives here and i'm i'm very very excited to do that but before we get into that um you know why, kate why don't we start with you why don't you let us know who you are where you work uh, and the type of work that you do Oh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, so my name is Kate Brown. I'm the executive director of the Global Island Partnership, and I'm based in uh, Mount Manganui, New Zealand, uh, which is a small coastal town in uh, south of the main largest city in New Zealand. And I work globally on uh, island resilience and sustainability issues, including uh, ocean conservation. Wonderful. Love it. Uh, Coral, how about yourself? Well, Fakalofala Hiatu from Niue. I'm based in Niue, which probably you haven't heard of. It's uh, You go to Fiji and turn right for about another 200 kilometers in the middle of the ocean. Um, so my name is Coral Pasisi. I am the president of a local nonprofit organization called Tofia Niue, which means the ocean of Niue in all its senses uh, and forms. Um, and so I uh, set up this local non-profit uh, organization and a public-private partnership with the government of Niue and a number of other stakeholders um, with the support of Oceans 5 to establish um, an EEZ-wide approach to dealing with our blue real estate, basically, um, to look at uh, setting up a large-scale marine protected area within that, which we now have done five years later, 40%. And, um, and really just linking that with the sustainable development agenda uh, of the country into the future. Um, and so we've had a number of partners and more recently brought on uh, the Blue Nature Alliance. Uh, we've worked with Kate and Gisper as well. So yeah, this has been a fun journey. I can imagine. That sounds, uh, that sounds amazing. I can't wait to find out uh, more in this episode. Uh, okay, Ginny, how about yourself? Tell us uh, who you are, uh, what you do, and the communities you work with. Um, yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I work for the Blue Nature Alliance. Uh, my name is Ginny Farmer, and I've been working in ocean conservation uh, for nearly two decades now. Um, I'm based in Arlington, Virginia, so I don't have a, a tight group of ocean conservationists nearby. Um, but I, the thing that I enjoy most about working for Conservation International and the Blue Nature Alliance is the opportunity that I get to learn about the lessons learned and the ch successes and challenges from our partners all around the world and share those lessons with one another. 
Love it. I love it. There is a lot of experience here in marine conservation and in different uh, parts of the world. And I, and I, I can't wait to sort of dive in uh, to finding out more about each and every one of you and the work that you do. What, what I find interesting about ocean conservation is, you know, everybody measures, you know, marine conservation, and ocean conservation success in different ways. Uh, and so I want to kind of get a, a, a sense for everybody here uh, in, on this interview of what ocean conservation uh, success means to you as well as the communities you work with. Cora, I'd love to start with you. Yeah, well, thanks, Andrew. Well, that's a big question. Um, I think there's there's so many different aspects of this. Um, but I, for me, as an islander, I mean, I was born and raised in a small island state in the middle of the biggest ocean in the world. Um, and for me, it's about ensuring that um, that this great wealth that has underpinned generations of our heritage and security and livelihoods is there for our children in the future. Um, because so much of our culture and language is tied to the way we interact with that environment. So first, uh, first and foremost, it absolutely has to make sense for the people of our country, if we're going to commit their resources to conservation um, or use, then it has to be in a way that supports that. I think secondly, because this is not a sealed off piece of real estate, it is part of a huge ecosystem that everyone benefits from in the region and globally. Um, we want to make sure that that whole ethical underpinning of ocean conservation and sustainable use is something that at least people appreciate and understand so that when we are uh, proposing to use or conserve the ocean space they understand why we're doing that and hopefully you know the sum of all our commitments is a big is a big one in total we, we're just a small nation um, but I think there are commitments that our country has made um, both the community and the government and the private sector in a way that's lasting that I think um, is a holistic approach to, to doing this. Uh, not as a new concept actually, something that is actually ingrained in our inherent sense of responsibility to look after the ocean. So I think if you grow policy around those basic uh, fundamentals at any level, including the international level, then it shouldn't be a hard sell uh, 30 by 20, 30. It should be an organic process that we all uh, engage and support. That makes complete sense. I, I, I love that. Uh, Kate, how about yourself? Uh, you know, what does ocean conservation success mean to yourself as well as uh, to those that you, the communities you work with? Yeah, I mean, I work all over the world, so with a very diverse um, set of both um, people, so from island leaders to often local communities or organisations that work with them, but also um, in countries that we would call developing and also developed countries. And there's some real common threads. We, we have to... Success is going to be achieving the global goal of 30% by 2030 because we know that um, we need to do it. We're... Um, if each of us slowly erodes away, we're going to have really nothing because as Coral said, it's not fenced. We're all connected by the ocean and we um, obviously live in the biggest um, ocean, the Pacific. And then I think we, we have to thread a careful road between kind of these big lofty global goals, which we can think are like, how am I going to achieve that, to what it means for someone in an island context or at a local community who... Um, are still interacting daily with the ocean. It's really different for them than it is for kind of people like me who used to live in Washington, D.C. and could have a more um, a, a kind of different relationship with it. And it's really been brought home to me because I moved back to where I came from, come from um, about it, more than a year ago and have to explain some of these ideas and why there is that global goal in my local space. Um, with people who are still using that resource, who feel a sense of both ownership and um, responsibility to that resource. And so we have to deliver something at the global level, but we also have to make sure that that connects to um, people who are um, stewards of the ocean um, and also that we deal with the people and places that are not doing that. So. Um, 
un illegal and unreported fishing, for example, and a whole range of other things that are negatively impacting the ocean. So it, it's many things, but we do need to achieve the global goal. Um, otherwise, we I'm not sure what the future will look like, like for our kids and the ones that follow. Absolutely, it makes complete sense. And and Ginny, you're you're based in in uh, Virginia, uh, so you know you have that sense of there's a lot of big organizations around you, and a lot of policies are being made for for you and the work that you've done uh, over the past couple of decades, and the work that you continue to do. What does ocean success mean to you? Uh, despite the fact that I'm not as close to the ocean as either Coral or Kate, I, I think that my vision of success for successful ocean conservation is really the same as theirs. I think it needs to be achieved at a global scale, um, but it, it can only be achieved at a global scale if it's locally driven and it derives benefits to local coastal communities. And I, I think that it really can benefit local coastal communities if it's done well. Fantastic. Now, you know, what's interesting, we talk about these these global sort of uh, goals. You know, uh, what I want to know is how, and, and, and Kate, we can start with you in terms of, like, how do you work uh, with and understand and interpret uh, the work towards those global conservation goals set by United Nations? For example, Kate, uh, you work uh, with, a, with a broad spectrum of people from presidents to local communities. How do you get different types of people from so many different places to work for that global goal? Yes, yeah, so we've been working on that for a really long time, um, not just on ocean, not just from ocean conservation, but across a range of conservation, um, livelihoods, resilience issues. And I think the key is um, sh working together on the things that you can agree on and not getting obsessed with where you don't agree with people. I think... Um, Ocean conservation in particular is an area that needs people to work in partnership because otherwise we're going to do lots of very similar things um, all over the place and really not have that much impact. I think um, for us that's really the key. We need to have clear and political leadership on the issue, which is why we work with political leaders, um, not just to articulate that at the international level, but also so that the support and the policies at, at island level or coastal level are actually being um, put into place and supported over time uh, so that action can actually happen and that local communities are supported um, to meet their aspirations. We have a, in our, I run a partnership, so we've been in existence since about 2006. We have a lot of organisations actually that fundamentally disagree with, with each other on a lot of things. Um, in fact, often don't like each other, don't trust each other. The, the, what we've tried to create in our partnership is a space where we work together on strategic issues that have to be dealt with by a collective rather than singular organisations or countries working on their own, um, and that we leave everything else at the door. We don't get into, you know, what this organization is doing um, in different places. And we also try to model a behavior type and value system that hopefully brings brings everyone along, that people want to be part of something that is uh, bigger than themselves. And so a little bit, it's a lot of building um, a, a framework of trust, to be honest, um, and then building on that. So trying to bring in people who may be not in that framework, but who you're trying to shift um, into engaging on the practical activities that uh, we can do together. And so I think an important part of that is really being able to understand what impact is being made um, together from that collective approach. And there are actually lots of models in different sectors for doing this type of work um, that we try to apply to the ocean conservation sec um, uh sector and it's really about knowing um, what you're trying to do together, measuring impact of it and then um, the whole uh, issue around trust. Very well said. Uh, Coral, how about yourself? Like, Do you have uh, certain ways that, that you work with communities? You mentioned as well you, d you deal with a lot of, of different partners, a lot of, you know, there's politicians, there's citizens, like how does that dynamic work uh, on, on, on your island? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think the first thing is it, it's not in isolation of everything else. So 
So, so these global targets uh, sit amongst a number of other global targets that are interrelated through the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, you know, one that small island states know very well are the targets in climate change. And because there is such a critical nexus between climate change and oceans, um, you know, kids at school know what the 30 by, by 2030 is. They know what 1.5 versus 2 degrees is and 2.4 and 3 degrees in, in the global climate con context. So I think actually um, the general population is quite knowledgeable about what those global targets are. One of the other critical things for us in the region, in most developing countries, but certainly in small island states, are the global financing mechanisms that help to implement these global commitments are really <clears throat> the only resources that we have access to that will help us implement these big commitments. And so we have to understand that process because uh, you know the environment is always the poor cousin in any government and it's even poorer in, in a developing country. And so we have to understand what the value is of those global commitments so far as it creates a market for us to secure the resources to drive um, conservation in the ocean, but that it links very much to our resilience to climate impacts, which we have very little control over. So I look at the ocean and climate change <clears throat> conventions uh, and agreements as two sides of, of a coin that only have value if if you actually bring them together. So we can, we can, as small island states, we can make a big difference in the resilience of the ocean because we can make commitments in that space and we have the jurisdiction to enforce those. Whether it's in climate change, it doesn't matter if we stop all our carbon tomorrow, it's not going to make a blip. So we rely on others to do that. So I think there is a level of, you know, we will stand the moral ground on oceans because we can do it and we have to show the integrity that that is a real commitment. And at the same time, we use that globally to say, this is why we're doing this because it makes sense for us. But it also means that this global commitment to the global environment means that bigger countries have to step up and also do the same. Because if we do this and no one changes their behavior in climate change, then it's, there's no point because our protection of that ocean is not going to stop acidification uh, from carbon dioxide of larger nations. So I think that there is a good understanding actually from from all levels of, of the community of that value. Um, but also I think it gives a sense of pride because New Orleans say, oh, so the globe has set a target of 30 by 2030 and we've already got 40% of our EZ now. So we that, that's fantastic. We're a small country, we don't stand out very much globally, but that's a pretty cool thing for our our little people in schools to be able to say, actually, we can hold our own on the global stage, even though we're little. True. And, but I mean, it's just, it's such a great thing to have too, right? Like to, to be able to have that, that much protected. I mean, that's just absolutely amazing. Um, Ginny, how about yourself? Uh, you know, dealing with a, a lot of different people in, in Arlington, uh, internationally. So how does that, uh, how does that work with, with yourself and your organizations? Well, I mean, partnership is at the core of the Blue Nature Alliance. And I will say we, we got started with the Blue Nature Alliance before COVID. And we got to, we, I got to travel to a couple of the places that the Alliance is partnering in. And that was fantastic. And I'm really looking forward to the day that I can get to Niue, for instance, um, and visit Coral. Uh, so it, it is definitely more challenging in this remote day of, of COVID. Um, but really seeking out champions in places that are looking to protect or uh, sustainably manage their, their ocean resources and trying to build those relationships and identify how we can help them achieve that vision in their place is, is the core of our, our work. Fantastic. Now, uh, Coral, you mentioned before, uh, you know, that you guys have a lot of blue real estate and you guys have, have been working to protect that because that uh, is your is your control um, being being able to have that kind of control and be able to work with that kind of real estate um, with within Nui? How like do you have do you have like what lessons do you have uh, that you can share with the rest of the world that might help other people and other nations be able to accomplish what you guys have been able to accomplish? Oh, geez, I need a couple of hours to answer that one, um, Andrew. I think, <laughs> let me summarize. 
so fundamental is is the net the desire of of the local communities who use the ocean resources to protect those resources right without that nothing above that actually will work so um, ensuring that you've got that from the communities that are uh, part of that ocean's resource the private sector who uses it for a living the government who rents space for fishing commercial fishing and whatnot um, and so having the conversations with all those stakeholders before you even embark is really critical I think the second critical thing is having partners who are flexible and happy for you to drive the agenda and not coming in with their agenda uh, with such strict approaches to funding that uh, it, you, they are driving, uh, the horse are driving the cart rather than the other way around. Um, and so through our process, we've had, uh, a fant Oceans 5 has been a fantastic and flexible partner with us. Um, and the other critical um, part, I think, of the success has been the public-private partnership arrangement that we've had. We're a really small country, small administration, at the best of times, very difficult to manage and enforce uh, this level, this whole EEZ area. So we have partnerships across the region that, are, that look at IUU fishing, for example, monitoring control and surveillance in general. Um, then we have um, then we have partnerships with uh, development partners and donors and non-profit organizations coming together on this common community country-led um, effort uh, and understanding everyone's interest at the beginning and agreeing that we can actually meet everyone's interest uh, has been critical and i think finally without uh, showing that we could break even at least let alone have increased benefits off that conservation pathway we would not have been able to pursue this. And I, quite frankly, would not have supported it because I don't think conservation in the context of small island developing states that doesn't generate revenue uh, and benefits to the people of, of the country will, will last. Um, and so that has the, the sustainable financing element of that has been a very important part of building this whole effort to be a sustainable commitment for the long term. So we never embarked on this looking at locking up for a little period of time. We looked at how do we put in place a revenue generation mechanism that will allow for the certainty and the true value of this long term commitment. And so we've built our sustainable financing mechanism about around at least a 40 year period, um, which we feel is is makes it worthwhile as an investment. As you know, conservation, you can't lock up for one year and expect that that's actually going to be useful. Um, it needs to be much longer term. Absolutely. It makes, yeah, it makes complete sense. Uh, Kate, how about yourself? The community within where, where you work w within, you know, what kind of lessons do you think uh, you could help, you know, teach other nations from the experience of yeah, in fact, our partnership focuses a lot on that, and it's we're working um, very specifically with the Blue Nature Alliance as well uh, to think through what are some of the good examples that are happening both within um, sites that the Blue Nature Alliance is involved in, but also in other places um, within our network. So we have a huge network of islands and organisations that work on islands on these issues who have been trialling different things for like years. Uh, so I think the key, uh, we have a um, this idea called Bright Spots, um, which is really things that can work and can be scaled and replicated. Um, and very much the idea of what is a bright spot is locally um, derived. So for a new way, it will be what makes sense for new way um, and something that we can take out to the rest of the world and that's really a lot of what our partnership does the global island partnership and how we're working with blue nature alliance because i think um you know the idea of no man is an island quite often islands are islands um and we need to kind of take what what is working um and also the challenges and share them and because we find that it both inspires people uh, to think that maybe the thing that they're doing actually isn't such a crazy idea. Um, it shows that 
particularly around issues of political leadership, that where countries have real courage to kind of do something like what Niue's done, other other islands and other places can think we could also do that, like someone's actually done it first, or we could do more. It can be we want to beat new ways, whatever new ways doing, and we can do more of it. So um, what we need to do is provide the platform for that to happen. And then, you know, at a very local level, there's um, all of this work, I think, is really about people. You know, the science is one part of it, it's, but it's really about how people work together, how people make decisions, how, what sort of behaviour change is needed at all levels, including amongst organisations like ourselves, to really make this happen. And so all the time it's a process of really um, taking in and working with people on what are some of the solutions that might work, um, what are the things we need to advocate for, um, at all different levels, and then how does that? How can that come back as policy, as leadership, and as other things that support this work? It's very much, I think, like a web or a brick wall of things. No one solution is really going to be the thing that works, but we have to um, we have to really filter all of them and help elevate them where they are working. Yeah, it makes uh, everything you guys are saying makes such complete sense. I think this is really valuable for a lot of people who are either just starting or sort of in that process and maybe hitting some barriers. So I think that's 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 really great. To sort of end off the the episode, I uh, want to kind of end it off with a bit of hope. It seems like a lot of you have had success with marine conservation uh, with you know the the thirty by thirty sort of in the process. Um, what do you see today in ocean conservation that, that makes you have hope uh, over the next 10 years? Um, well, I think two things, and one of which I think Kate alluded to in her last response, uh, which is we're really starting to find that matrix of options and figuring out how to pull together different solutions in a way that will both protect our ocean, but also derive benefits for local coastal communities that are, are stewarding those resources. Um, and I think finding those different ways of combining solutions to get those dual benefits is something that I'm really excited about for the future. And the second thing is, I think there's just a lot of momentum behind large scale ocean conservation at the moment. There's been a, a huge growth over the last decade in the designation of large scale marine protected areas. And I think that's likely to continue growing. Uh, with the push for, for 30 by 30. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's definitely hopeful to see uh, with, the, with the next 10 years. Um, Coral, how about yourself? What, what do you find that, that, that you are getting excited about that you find that's hopeful for the, for the future? Um, well, in true island fashion, let me start with a downer first. Um, COVID-19 has actually threatened the ocean conservation space considerably in the last year and a half. We were already on a really significant ramp up of conservation commitments across the Pacific region since around 2010, when our leaders started a process um, called the Oceanscape Framework, where they called on everyone to commit um, conservation um, as part of the larger uh, use of uh, ocean resources. And I think what the challenge that I've seen is, you know, it's always a there's a short term economic gain to be to be had by um, harvesting ocean resources to overcome what is a very significant debt level rising uh, in small island states across the Pacific. Um, to to answer your question about what what gives me hope in that space is is despite that challenge, despite now countries being uh, mortgaged to the hilt in trying to provide uh, funding for schools and, and uh, health care and those critical things, our leaders are still standing up strong, calling on the international community to make commitments in ocean uh, conservation and global environmental integrity. And again, on the ramp of, of climate change, make those commitments um, critically now because we have no more time. We, we pretty much have run out of time in the climate change space. And so we're, we're throwing everything at this now. Um, and so if leaders are making those commitments because they know that the global environment, as the global environment is degrading, 
every unit of conservation on the ocean is increasing in value, is increasing in importance to counter that. And so um, I think I think our leaders and our communities understand that. And I think they they can't always see their ability to effect global change on big things like climate change and ocean acidification. But they can see that if they protect this little area or this bigger area within their countries, EEZ, then that is actually going to make a small difference. And that collective small differences uh, from the Pacific perspective, where we have 30% of the world's EEZs, Actually, even though we're small island states, collectively we can make a big difference. And our leaders have committed to establishing a, 25, uh, a strategy for the Blue Pacific Ocean by, 25, by 2050 that is, is putting forward our collective ocean as a blue continent to say we're going to manage this in a responsible way and a big part of that is going to include conservation. Wonderful, wonderful. I love I loved to hear that hope. Uh, and... Uh, Last but very not least, uh, Kate, how about yourself? What do, what do you find that's exciting you to be hopeful for the next well, I'm 10 gonna, years? If Coral can have negatives, I'm having negatives too. Um, so <laughs> we used to work <laughs> together, so we, we have to have the... Um, no, I think, you know, what makes me really concerned is, well, besides COVID, obviously, but it's the it's still these really big existential issues that I still am a bit worried about, like the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis, um, which are twinning and just, you know, we keep, I feel like the 20s, the, you know, we're in 2021, are the decade where we, you know, it's up to us. We have to, it's up to us to do something. I have never felt that more keenly than I do uh, right now. But to flip that over, I think there's been some things that have happened um, that do give me a lot of hope. And I also think that I tend to be a glass half full person anyway. But, you know, things like what Coral was talking about with the Pacific Island leaders, like that coming together and continuing that momentum is really important and we need it from everyone. I think that... Um, there's that conservation itself, um, not just ocean conservation, but conservation itself is transformed in the time that I've been working in or working alongside the sector. So, uh, you know, 20, 25 years ago, conservation organisations would come and do projects in places and, you know, um, help those community people and do their thing now and you see it very much in um, the Blue Nature Alliance it's meeting it's consulting with what those local people actually want and seeing whether they're a good fit and actually trying to do something that makes sense in that way so you move away from this kind of short-term project driven um, support for conservation to kind of long-term transformation and I think when we can do more transformative conservation, which requires us and those who are in conservation organisations to transform how we work, really important. I think the, the ocean conservation space is one that needs partnership more than almost anywhere. And I think one of the reasons why I've been saying all over the place that I don't think that we achieve the goals in, um, of, the, uh, of the meagre goals we had before the 20 the 30 by 2030, uh, is because people, organisations were doing their own thing, um, big things, but big things on their own, you know, big things with lots of money. Um, that's not necessarily, I think, how we're going to achieve um, transformative change. And then finally, I think um, in the time also that I've been working in uh, conservation, and it kind of links up to an, er an earlier point I just made, is the recognition of the critical leadership and value of indigenous and local communities in this space, um, that is transformed. It's really different. And so I think we need to, to have more of that. We need to have more um, of what is quite difficult um, because you're talking about lots of different people, but it's the thing I think that gives me great hope is the potential role and the actual current role of indigenous and local communities in this big transformation. I love it. This has been uh, absolutely amazing. It's great to see that hope. Of course, it always comes 
with some kind of downer at, at some point, but that's just the way we live, and that's why we need that hope, and that's why it's always great to, to have that in the future. I do agree that uh, collaboration is the key. I see, I see that we're starting to see that more and more, uh, and over the next 10 years, I think we're going to see a definite payoff, uh, especially with this uh, 30% by 30, 2030. So, uh, ladies, this has been such a treat for us to, to have, for me to have you on the, on the podcast and be a part of this. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your busy day and the work that you do to come on and, and, and tell us about the work that you're doing, what you're hoping to see in the future uh, and sort of the lessons learned that, that you've gone through, through your experience. And again, I just want to thank you so much uh, for, for doing all this uh, and look forward to having you back on and hearing more stories and, and, and more successes uh, and sharing uh, some more of your experiences in the future. So thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank and you, nice Andrew. to see you again, Kate and Ginny. Yeah. You too, Carol and Ginny. Thank you so much for joining us, Kate Coral and Ginny, on the Speak Up for the Ocean Blue podcast. This is a special edition with the Blue Nature Alliance. And I'll tell you, uh, there are, again, a lot of gems in this. It's so wonderful to be able to uh, learn from the experience of all three of these ladies. And, and they bring so much experience and from multiple scales and multiple places around the world. I think this is really great to be able to have these types of conversations. And I, I implore you to put in the comments below, you know, what you think of this conversation, what you think of this interview and how you, if you work in marine conservation, how you use people knowledge and partner or and networks into marine conservation. Love to hear what you think about this episode and what your experiences bring uh, to the table. It's always great to hear from various people. So thank you so much for joining us today. If you want to have more information, go to bluenaturealliance.org. The link will be in the description below. If you want to listen to the audio podcast of this, you can go to speakupforblue.com. Again, the link will be in the comments or in the show notes below. Uh, I want to thank you so much for joining us on this special edition of the Speak Up for the Ocean Blue podcast. I'm your host, Angela. Have a great day. We'll talk to you next time and happy conservation.